Welcome to Ancient Philosophy Lecture 16. Today we're going to be discussing Aristotle on perception. This will introduce us into Aristotle's psychology, which will then set us up to discuss Aristotle's view of the mind and then the mind in action. This will be our job this week, and then the following week we'll look at how this works out in Aristotle's ethics. So let's go ahead and jump in and talk about an outline of De Anima. So I sent you earlier the reading from De Anima. We're going to be reading chapters 1 and 2 of book 1, and then the entirety of chapter 2. And then we'll read a section of book 3. So in books 1 and 2 of De Anima, Aristotle is introducing the theme, and he surveys some views about the soul. Remember that De Anima is translated on the soul. In De Anima book 2, we get a more overview presentation of Aristotle's account of psychology. So Aristotle gives a definition of the soul, outlines his study of it, and then he tells us how he's going to pursue this study. So that's found in De Anima 2, books 1 through 3. In chapter 4 of De Anima 2, he discusses nutrition and reproduction. And in chapters 5 and 6, he discusses sensation, or perception in general. In chapters 7 through 11, Aristotle discusses each of the five senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. As an aside, if you look briefly at Book 3, Chapter 1, you can see that Aristotle makes the claim that there are just the five senses. And then at the end of Book 2, Chapter 12, Aristotle summarizes his view and gives a general account of perception. In Book 3, Chapter 8, which we'll look at next time when we're discussing the mind and the mind's role in action, Aristotle gives a general definition and nature of the soul. Okay, so let's look in general at Aristotle's view of the soul. In the ancient period, the soul was conceived of as the principle of living things. It's that which explained why plants, animals, and people have movement and cognition. The soul wasn't taken in the sense of an entity that is separable, necessarily, that will exist after life. The soul was conceived of as that which helped to explain why certain bodies, the animate bodies, were alive as opposed to the inanimate bodies. Now, Aristotle's predecessors had a variety of different views on the soul. There were materialists about the soul, and then there were people like Plato and the Pythagoreans that thought that the soul was an immaterial entity that could be separable from the body and survive after death. On these various views, the soul is independent of the body in the sense that it's separable either as a part, as a material part, or as an immaterial entity that somehow or another is fused with the body. Aristotle is going to conceive of the soul in terms of his distinction between matter and form. He thinks that the soul is the form of the natural body having life potentially in it. The soul is the inner principle of change and rest. It explains, as we'll see in a bit, a bunch of different states that are found in different kinds of living beings. So it's important to keep in mind the difference here between Plato and Aristotle. For Plato, there's the world of matter. There are individual things. And they are the things they are in virtue of participating in an ideal form that exists in an abstract space. So as we saw when we were studying Plato's view, the ideal form is abstract. It can be grasped by the mind. It is the paradigm of the thing of its kind. So, for example, the ideal form of horse, right, is the paradigm of horse. But the ideal form of horse, paradoxically, isn't itself a horse. It is an abstracta that's grasped with the mind. But a particular thing is a horse in virtue of participating in the form of horse. Aristotle thinks that that picture is inadequate. In its place, he distinguishes between matter and form. He explains that individual things are unity, comprising both matter and form, where the form, as we've seen, is the internal principle of change that organizes the matter and strives toward the fulfillment, the telos, of that particular thing. So for Aristotle, he thinks that his account of, of soul fits very well with his distinction between matter and form and will help elucidate some puzzles about the nature of the soul. So let's start discussing Aristotle's view of the soul in virtue of the problem of dualism. So this is the problem of understanding how the soul and the body fit together. We can think about the body in terms of what occupies space, what has a defined location, what has a form, what we can get at by the sense of touch, what we can see with vision. The body itself 
can survive lots of changes. So even though the body replaces its cells, the soul still remains the same. The person still remains the same. Moreover, the person or the soul can survive losses to particular body parts. If in a very unfortunate accident you were to lose a hand or to lose an arm, you would still remain the same person. So there's a way of thinking about the body that's different from the way we have to think about the soul. We can also think about the soul more directly. The soul has thoughts. We looked in the Phaedo for Socrates' argument that the soul is distinct from the body and the soul survives death. And one of the things that Socrates argues is that the soul is able to grasp these forms. The soul is able to think about justice itself. This doesn't seem to be a property that the body has. The body doesn't seem to be a thinking thing. Rather, it seems to be of the essence of the soul to be thinking. Moreover, there's something it's like to be a person. We enjoy our favorite ice cream. We enjoy our favorite piece of music. There's some distinct pleasure and pains within the soul. These seem to be distinct properties of individuals. And what we'll see in a minute, and as we saw in the photo, is that the soul has causal powers. We can act for reasons. So these are different properties between the soul and the body, and so there's a natural question about how they fit together. In De Anima, Book 2, Chapter 1, Aristotle begins to apply his distinction between matter and form to the soul. So he writes, for example, Now, given that there are bodies of such and such kind having life, the soul cannot be a body. For the body is the subject or matter, not what is attributed to it. Hence, the soul must be a substance in the sense of the form of a natural body having life potentially within it. So he here applies his account of matter and form to the soul, explaining that the soul isn't a body, that the soul is the form of a natural body. So Aristotle continues later in the chapter to, to explain how his view answers the problem of dualism. He says, that is why we can dismiss as unnecessary the question whether the soul and the body are one. It is as though we were to ask whether the wax and its shape are one. Unity has many senses, but the proper one is that of actuality. So let's think about this in terms of the picture I have up here. Let's suppose that the potter here is creating a bowl out of clay. And we think about that as a finished product. Should we think about the clay and the bowl as being separate or being one? For Aristotle, the way to think about this is that they are in a, it's an organic unity of form and matter. The clay has taken on the form of the bowl. And so the two are inseparable as that organic unity. So Aristotle's idea here is that the person is an organic unity of matter and form where the soul is the form, the living principle of the material body. So this should remind you a little bit of Simeus's objection to Socrates' account of the soul in the Phaedo. Remember, Simeus objected. He said the soul is a harmony. Recall what Simeus says to Socrates. He says one might say the same thing about attunement as well and a lyre and strings, that the attunement is something invisible, incorporeal, and utterly beautiful and divine in the tuned lyre, whereas the lyre itself and its strings are bodies, corporeal, composite, and earthly, and akin to the mortal. So when someone either smashes the lyre or cuts and snaps its strings, what if one were to insist, with the same argument as yours, that the attunement will still exist and not have perished? For there would be no way when the lyre still exists with its strings snapped and when the strings themselves, which are of a mortal kind, still exist, that the attunement, which is akin to and of the same nature as the divine and immortal, could have perished and perished before the mortal did. No, this person would say the attunement must still exist on its own somewhere, and the bits of wood and the string must rot away before anything happens to the attunement. In actual fact, Socrates, I think, you yourself are aware that we take the soul to be something of precisely this kind, since our body is made taut, so to speak, and held together by hot, cold, dry, and wet, and certain other th such things, and our soul is a blend of an attunement of those very things, when they are blended properly and proportionally with one another. So we think of Aristotle's view here as very similar to Simeus's objection, that since the soul is the form of the body, and that the human person cannot exist without the body, when the body is destroyed, the form likewise is no longer present. 
So let's explore this in some more detail by recalling Plato's objections to Simmias' view. So recall Socrates gives the argument from recollection. He says, you know, remember Simmias that we had discussed recollection, and if that view is right, then in order to account for learning, the soul needs to exist before the, bo the body. But if the soul is a harmony of a composite thing, being elements of the body in a state of tension, then the soul can't exist without the body. The soul can't exist before the body. So if learning is by recollection, then the soul is in a harmony. Now similarly, Plato could argue that in order to account for a view of how learning is possible, the soul needs to exist before the body. And even if on Aristotle's view, the soul is the living principle of the body, the soul cannot exist before the body and so doesn't provide an account of learning. And so here, this is a, this is a problem for Aristotle's account to provide an account of how learning is possible. The second argument that Socrates, Plato gives in the Phaedo, is that the soul has unique causal powers and a harmony doesn't have causal powers. So he says in, he says in Phaedo, he says, an attunement is not the sort of thing to govern its components, but rather to follow them. So changes in the, in the lyre make changes in the attunement, but not vice versa. Changes in the attunement don't make changes in the lyre. And so Plato is thinking, but this isn't the case because we can intend, we can decide, we can act for reasons, which makes changes to our body. It's not the other way around. And so there's a question here for Aristotle's view, how does he make sense of the soul having causal power? And here Aristotle is on a better footing, because remember for Aristotle, forms are active principles in nature. They're metaphysically primitive. And so he can think that, yes, the soul does have causal powers because it's a form, and forms themselves have underived causal powers. So let's continue to talk about Aristotle's view of the soul. So recall the soul is the principle of life. Now this principle differs in plants, animals, and humans. They are all ensouled. They all have souls. Remember, that sounds odd to us, but it wouldn't sound odd to Plato and to Aristotle and those of that time because they're thinking that the suke, the soul, is just the, the principle that explains life in all its many forms. And so what Aristotle is going to do is he's going to look at the powers of the soul and how different kinds of beings have different powers. So Aristotle identifies the powers of nutrition, growth, reproduction, perception, or sensation, and reasoning. So plants have the powers of nutrition, growth, and reproduction. Animals have those powers and also the power of perception. They can move around as well. And humans have those powers in addition to the power of reasoning, both practical reasoning and theoretical reasoning. And so what we're going to do with Aristotle's account is to get a, an account of nutrition and growth, of reproduction, of perception and reasoning. Now we're not going to look at all this in any detail. We'll focus on perception and reasoning. But I just want to point out that in De Anima, Book 2, Chapter 4, Aristotle thinks that there's something divine about reproduction. He says, the form of living things includes a force to transmit that form. And then he writes that for any living being that has reached maturity, the most natural act is the production of another like itself, in order that it may partake in the eternal and divine. So Aristotle thinks that this process of making a thing like oneself that's distinct is a way for finite beings to participate in the divine. This would apply to plants, to animals, and of course to humans. Aristotle says later that this is the only way possible for these beings to participate in the divine. He says, since then no living thing is able to partake in what is eternal and divine, by uninterrupted continuance, for nothing perishable can ever remain one and the same, it tries to achieve that end in the only way possible for it, and that is by reproduction. So now let's turn to the power of the soul that both animals and humans have in common, that's perception. So Aristotle writes at the end of book two in De Anima, he says that a sense faculty is that which has the power of receiving into itself the sensible form of things without the matter. 
in the way in which a piece of wax takes on the impress of the signet ring without the iron or the gold. So we have here an ancient signet ring, and the idea is that the wax can take on its form when you take the signet ring and press it into the wax. And what's left is something that's like the signet ring. It has the same form, but it doesn't take on the matter. And so Aristotle thinks this is how it works in perception, that the sensible form is received into the person's intellect. Now that sensible form is had by the particular perceived object. The sensible form of the tree, as we'll see in a bit, is an appearance, and that appearance in virtue of being a sensible form is in the tree, much like we have discussed discussed before that forms are in the object. So he continues, he says, the sense is affected by what is colored or flavored or sounding, not in so far as each is what it is, but in so far as it is of such and such a sort according to its form. So there's one thing here that I want to note. I want to note the distinction between the form of a perceived thing and its sensible form. So remember the form of a natural object is its internal principle of change and rest. So the form of a tree is that which takes the seed and develops it into a mature tree. It's its principle of change and rest. In addition to the internal form that explains the growth and development of the tree, there is the sensible form which exists in the tree as a potentiality to be perceived within creatures who have the power of perception. This is, so this is important. We want to distinguish between the form, which explains the growth, the principle of change for the object, and its sensible form. Both are within the object. The one, the form, explains the growth of the object. The sensible form explains the power of that object to be perceived. So remember the builder building analogy. So the builder has within themselves the form of a house. And the builder impresses upon the wood the form of the house so that the house itself has the form of the house. The form is now imminent. It's actualized in the house. Similarly, objects that are perceived have within themselves the sensible form. And those objects cause perceivers to have within themselves that sensible form, that the sense the senses, the, sensor, the sensory organs take within themselves that sensible form. So for Aristotle, perception is a change. It's a change in the perceiver, but it's a change of a very special sort. It's a change that requires a sensible form. So let's continue to press this home by talking about perceptual awareness and how this works within Aristotle's view of perception. So the perceptual awareness of a tree is the very same sensible form as it exists in the tree. Only when one is aware of that sensible form, that form is actualized in the perceiver. So this is a very different view from modern views of, for example, vision. We understand vision in terms of the effect of energy having on, on the eye, and then that being transferred into information somehow or another. Now there are lots of contemporary questions still about perception. It is a very active field that people are working on. But it's very important to realize that for Aristotle, there is a transfer of form from something that is in the object. And perceiving is caused by that sensible form becoming activated within the perceiver. So there's not a, there's not a lot of room on Aristotle's view for skepticism because one is picking up a feature of the object itself. The sensible form of an object is the appearance it actually has. So the sensible form of a tree is its appearance, which in some sense or another is in the tree. Now remember, forms aren't material properties. They're not organizational properties of matter. They're added to those properties. Now I think what's going on here is Aristotle seems driven to this view that the sensible form has to be in the object in virtue of understanding how change works and how the matter and form distinction needs to work. A sense faculty is the faculty it is because it has a potentiality for taking on sensible forms. So we'll see in a bit that it can be changed by the 
it can be changed into an organizational state that's similar to the organizational state that's in the tr that's in the tree or in the object that's perceived. So the way Aristotle was thinking about this is the tree causes me to see a tree, which is this appearance, this form, the sensible form that's in the object, which somehow or another activates the median between the perceiver and the, and the object. And so that's how, in the signet ring analogy, it's impressed upon the sense organ. Again, this is very similar to the builder-building analogy. In the builder, remember, there's the form of a house, and he is impressing that form on the wood, which, when it's actualized, forms a house. Similarly here, the tree has within it the sensible form, and that is causing perceivers to receive this form into the intellect, and that constitutes a perception of the tree. So there is a puzzle here for Aristotle for understanding how the transmission of sensible forms can occur. And so this is the last part of what we'll discuss with Aristotle's account of perception before in the next lecture we turn to understand Aristotle's account of the mind. Broadly speaking, there are two positions here. There is the materialist position and there's the spiritualist position. They're attempts to understand the transmission of sensible forms and what we'll see that they both have questions. So it's very much like the ancient task of Odysseus trying to go between the very narrow passage between Scylla and Charybdis. If you recall from Homer's Odyssey, Scylla is a six-headed monster that lives on a rocky terrain, and Charybdis is a whirlpool. If you veer a little bit close to either one, it's absolute destruction. This is often taken to be a metaphor of the difficulty of navigating the via media, or the middle path, the narrow middle path between two extreme views. So let's look at the materialist view. We can take a poor man's version of the materialist view to start with, so here, reception of, for example, the sensible form red would require that the eye itself actually turns red, right? So there, we would have a property, a sensible form that exists in the object, and the sense organ actually acquires that very property by changing into that property. Now, Aristotle doesn't need to be committed to this view. More generally, we could understand that a sensible form is a certain organized state of matter. So an object that is red is in a certain organized state, and what it is to perceive a red object is to receive that sensible form by acquiring a similar structural organization in the sense faculty itself. Now, the problem with materialist views is that it does, doesn't make sense of the experience of red, of what it is to be conscious of red. If, for example, you were to paint the eye red, that doesn't mean that you're going to perceive red. Similarly, if you take a stone and you place it on the eye, you will not perceive a stone. So the problem for the materialist view is it just leaves out of the whole picture of what it is to be conscious of a perceived object. Now, a spiritualist view, by contrast, says that what it is to perceive red, what it is to receive in the intellect the sensible form red, is for the sensible form just to occur in the intellect. Now, this isn't much of an explanation. It's a very minimal commitment. The problem with this view is it doesn't actually explain how this is actual perceiving and not just telepathy, that somehow or another in the vicinity of objects the sensible forms just occur within the mind. So Aristotle addresses this in the chapter on sound, which is chapter 8 in De Anima Book 2. He says that in the case of sound, air is moved by the object. And then there's air which is inside the ear, and the air from, from the external source affects the air inside the ear, and the air inside the ear takes on the same organization as the air that was, you know, received uh, from the object. And now, the physical description of this process of, you know, air moving into the ear, and then the air in the ear acquiring the same properties of the air that moved into the ear isn't going, of course, to explain what it is to perceive sound, because the air there is just the air there is just communicating the sensible form. And remember the sensible form isn't 
a structural form of matter itself. It's not a material entity. It's just that the communication has to happen through the material entity. Now there's a lot of interesting asides that we could go on with Aristotle's view of perception. There are plenty of articles written on that, so if you're at all interested in working on your final paper on Aristotle and perception, just email me and I can send you a few articles that will be good to discuss. Okay, so I hope that is a helpful discussion of Aristotle's view on the soul and on perception, and we will pick up next time to talk about Aristotle's view of the mind and then the mind in action which, remember, is going to set us up for Aristotle's ethics. So keep on reading, keep on thinking about these issues. I hope what you can see through a study of ancient philosophy is that it still raises a lot of fascinating questions that we are still thinking about.